Hello, and welcome to another episode of Chatter, a podcast from The Gist, with me, Josh Hamilton. Alexander Homitz from the Connolly Youth Movement was our guest on this episode of the show. Right now, we're experiencing what I'm sure will be looked back on as a really volatile and crucial period in the history of humanity. One thing is certain is that post-corona, the world is unlikely to be quite the same, and if we're lucky, we might be able to use this moment for some really positive changes. What is certain is that those changes are unlikely to come from the top down. They're more likely to emerge or be demanded by grassroots movements. And in trying to get an understanding of this, I wanted to speak to someone involved in groups who are trying to imagine how these changes might come about. And that's how I find Alex. We chatted about his critique of electoral politics, about the EU and global finance forming a new form of imperialism, and how the CYM is trying to build ways to force changes outside of the traditional systems through trade unions and tenants unions. If you haven't already and you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast and to our mailing list. And don't forget my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, is now available for pre-order on Amazon. You'll find the link in the description below. Here's Alexander Homitz. So, Alex, pleasure to have you on the show. Pleasure to be here. So, what is the Connolly Youth Movement for, in a nutshell, for people who don't know? In a nutshell, it's a communist youth organization named after James Connolly, one of the leading Republican socialists and Marxists of the 20th century. And essentially what it tries to do is take everything he wrote, apply it to modern standards and struggle for the workers' republic that essentially he was executed for. So why did you choose to join? I looked at the landscape of left organizations while I was growing up and when I was 17 and 18, and there was an attempt to recruit me to the Socialist Party. And one of the reasons I opted not to join was due to their very strong anti-communism. So a couple of years passed and five years ago in 2014, I approached the Communist Party And I kind of just inquired, what was it all about? And after a three and a half hour conversation, I decided that this would be my political home. At the time when I joined, the Connolly Youth Movement um, didn't have branches outside of Dublin. So one of the first tasks that I set about for myself and the other young comrades who was in the party at the time, Fergal Toomey, the first task we set out was that for a revolution to take place, it will be led by young people. Therefore, our communist movement requires uh, an energetic and a very active youth movement. So I ended up joining the CYM, but there was no CYM in Cork. So we kind of kicked off a branch and began to build it step by step. But what actually politicized me five years ago was um, Operation Protective Edge when Israel was bombing Palestine. And that was my first political protest. So I I came to politics quite late in comparison to some of the very inspiring young people who come to politics at the age of 15 or 16 today through climate strike or any other number of issues. Why did that inspire you to come to politics more than something closer to home? What was it that that, that, sparked something in you about that particular conflict? That's a good question. Um, As somebody who's not native to Ireland, I don't have any roots here. So I can't, you know, I I feel like every kind of second Irish person has a relative who fought in the War of Independence or who did this or who did that. In the six counties, it's even more linked because civil war wasn't that long ago. So everybody is connected in some way or the other. Whereas as somebody who has no connection, I didn't feel that organic link. And it wasn't true republicanism, like most other young people find their way to socialist or communist politics. It was true an international incident. And when I watched Israeli jets execute children on the beach with guided missiles, I couldn't really, I didn't really know how to respond. I was so, so angry and pissed off and frustrated that I felt like I'd have to respond somehow. So I just went to the protest and that was my, my kind of introduction to political agitation. So what is it about James Connolly, would you say, that made people name uh, this particular movement after him? Do you want to, uh, how, how good is your history on James Connolly? Do you want to give like a little? Yeah, no problem. Um, Connolly 
is the kind of perfect example of a working class man who experienced sheer, sheer poverty, ended up joining the British Army when he was 14, left the British Army and then spent a life agitating for socialism. And as you read his publications dating back to like 1893 and all the way till 1916, uh, the final edition of his paper, The Workers' Republic, was published maybe a month before the Easter Rising. And all the way then, you can see how his political thought develops. And obviously, quotes such as Karl Marx being the greatest thinker of all time give you an indication of where exactly his politics is going. So the, the CYM was actually founded in the build up to the 50th anniversary of the 1916 Rising, which was in 1966. And the CYM was founded a couple of years beforehand, essentially to re-energize that kind of militant left republicanism, that socialism republicanism, and to ask the question, well, the War of Independence occurred, the country was partitioned, and did social conditions change? They didn't. And that's fundamentally what Connolly wrote about. He spoke specifically about if if you raise the green flag over Dublin Castle, that England would still rule Ireland through banks, through financiers, through insurance companies. And we saw that that exact phenomenon occur. So it's not only that Connolly was very, had a lot of foresight in how he understood capitalist economics and imperialism. It's also because he was the cement between republicanism and socialism, cement that by the looks of it didn't really exist in the past and only was touched on briefly. If you go back as far as the Land League times, the 1870s, you have people like Fintan Lawler, who Connolly actually refers to, who also touches on the necessity of the urban proletariat and the small peasants having to come together. And then before Fintan Lawler, you have your uh, Robert Emmett and Wolf Tone, also interesting characters, but they didn't articulate um, the need to change the social and political makeup of Ireland in the very same way as Connolly did. And that, that kind of lies at the root of the fact that Connolly was a very well-read Marxist thinker uh, and actor. It, it, I get the impression, at least from, from, from what I can, I, like from who I've spoken to and read, that uh, socialism in, in Ireland seems to have much more power and hold, I would say, than, than it would do in in uh, mainland or on the the mainland in Great Britain, maybe you wouldn't call the mainland that's per per sort of choice of words, perhaps, but you know what I mean. <laughs> um, yeah. So why do you think that is, or like maybe you disagree with that 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 assessment? Yeah, I I mean, the historical oppression that Ireland has faced, either at the hands of the British state or the European Union, or more recently the American Chamber of Commerce. Ireland is a, remains a colony, essentially, that's fully dependent on finance capital from other institutions. And the Comprador kind of parties like Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, the DUP, um, the Social Democrats, the Greens, they facilitate the movement of capital through Ireland and as such are essentially a managerial sort of ruling class. So the reason that the, the reason is quite straightforward that there, there's a both historical link to republicanism, which is inherently anti-imperialistic, and there's a contemporary struggle going on. The the local bourgeoisie, families like, I'm sure you heard of the Keelings family, right? Mm-hmm. Families like Keelings and other large um, agricultural or beef barons like Larry Goodman exploit migrant workers. So there's a kind of dual edge to Ireland's place in the European Union. On the one hand, it takes on the debts of the European Union and basically pays off the debts of private gamblers and speculators. And on the other hand, when young Irish people end up leaving, what the big bourgeoisie do here is they don't improve conditions so that people stay. They run them down as low as possible and then use the reserve labor that the European Union has provided for them to bring them in. So it's it's both a victim and elements of the, the like small bourgeoisie in Ireland benefit from the fact that Ireland is gridlocked into imperialist structures. So you talk about you talked uh, at the start about wanting to facilitate and hope to to create some form of of revolution. Like, what form does that take in in your mind? Well, I think there are certain steps that have to be taken to create a revolutionary organization first, and then. Those steps work in conjunction with capitalism falling into crisis. So it's not a question of 
say, importing loads of weapons and driving down tanks down O'Connell Street, as 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 much as you'd like to do that, that's not really how it works. In my understanding, there are certain certain steps. So I'll elaborate. So the first step I would say and understand uh, as a kind of Bolshevik kind of understanding of it is that you need a revolutionary party that can take advantage of capitalism when it falls into crisis and actually take on the state. The second step is that that revolutionary party has to be has to have its ear to the ground of the working class. So it's not good enough that lots of the left organizations in Ireland are quite dislocated from the working class, that they only show up uh, once every couple of years for elections that they take, they essentially going to take the working class for a ride and use the best elements of it and churn out the rest. Where And that's not the working class leading its own emancipation. You know, Connolly has a quote that says, the Irish working class are the sole incorruptible inheritors of Irish independence. And I think what that means is that it's not going to be a party with a couple of hundred people that's going to lead the revolution. It's going to be the organized working class. And our job is to organize our class. Do I think revolution will come peacefully or violently? It will never come peacefully. The ruling class, the Keelings of this world, the Dennis O'Briens, the European Union will never hand over political power to the working class without a struggle. And anybody who denies that, in my opinion, is quite delusional. We have to accept the fact that there will be a violent confrontation with the forces of capital, because if we march on Dublin hypothetically, we're not just marching on Fianna Gael, Fianna Fáil. We're marching on the American Chamber of Commerce, all the multinationals that are here, all their financial interests, all of the European Union companies, the German companies, the ones who, the tax havens from Luxembourg, all of them, and also the British state. It is in the interest of the British state to have Ireland partitioned, to have it under the thumb of other imperialist powers, and to ensure that nothing ever occurs here. So imagine the, the, the response that we would feel if we just upped and went tomorrow and attempted to overthrow the state. We have to be prepared for that. Why would you say it's in England's or in Britain's best interest to maintain Ireland under the thumb of some form of an imperial system? Well, since the days of Britain being in Ireland, Ireland has always been used either to fuel the Industrial Revolution or to fuel its flow of finance capital. So the amount of British companies that use the oil of man in Ireland interchangeably it's quite large. So it's in the interest from a financial point of view, but also a political point of view and a, and a kind of very old, crude, geographic one. Ireland was always considered the back door to Britain. If a revolution took place in Ireland and Ireland became the Cuba of Europe, which is our goal, Ireland will be the fucking Cuba of Europe. I promise you that. What would the British ruling class look to their neighbour and go, oh shit, you, 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 you know, you can row or you can canoe over from the top of the north to Scotland. So we're quite close. Mm -hmm. And if the response of the United States has been to embargo Cuba, what would the British state do after all these years of actually having military boots on the ground and partitioning the country in the first place? What would you say to the thought that the British working class have actually instigated more of a revolution than, than the Irish working class in, in, in the Brexit vote? Like that's that's it's that's it. that's more of an upset to those kind of grander structures in a way than than Ireland have ever managed to rock the boat. Maybe that's an in <laughs> yeah. I understand what you're saying. I, I think that's an interesting proposition. Um, but you see that the capitalist class who wanted Brexit and who didn't want it are already coming to arrangements that would benefit them. So even though the referendum was quite revolutionary in its own way and it was a break from the European Union, it wasn't led by the working class. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, who makes the decisions? Who makes the treaty agreements? Who makes the, how, how will, you know, how will companies shuffle and move around? Those arrangements are clearly being made to ensure that interests are safeguarded and met. So even though that referendum was successful by a small margin, the net result is that the working class continued to get shafted. I would have voted for Brexit if I had the vote just to be perfectly clear, because the long-term contradictions that it exposes between Britain and the European Union are very, very important. But nevertheless, that's why the Lexit campaign was so weak. Uh, it wasn't front and centre. It was Nigel Farage being par paraded up and down Sky News and BBC for interviews. And, you know, that's very important because even though 
he's not really representative of a grand movement or anything. And I'm sure there are more left wing people in Britain than there are Nigel Farage types. That's the way it looked, and that's kind of that's a big problem. Uh, economically, at least, there's there is quite a lot of evidence to suggest you're right. I mean, uh, Corbyn's platform, when detached from Corbyn's name, had a, a pretty broad like majority support for most of the policies yep. that he was implementing. Do you ever see Ireland uh, attempting to leave the European Union? Because there was a lot of people like discussing that during the Brexit campaign. Like Farage was yep. one of the people who who said, you know. Ireland, they're gonna be next. They're follow. They're gonna follow in our footsteps. And then you just look at the the polling that that comes out anyway of, about the Irish approval of the European Union. It's like up in the eighty ninety percent range. Is there any? That's right. Is there any case for that happening in the next I, five to ten years? Or, or Ireland is the most europhilic country in the entire European Union, and that's a result of the amount of propaganda that both the ruling parties here have put forward and also the European Union itself. And it's obviously been quite successful. But what we're seeing is, is the ruptures and the failings of capitalism are so blatant and obvious that people are reconsidering what is the European Union for and what is this, what is Ireland's place for it. And sadly, just like in Britain, it's the right that are actually leading the, that conversation. It's not the left, not in Ireland. We're not loud enough. We're not big enough. We're not strong enough. And also, you have the problem that certain left organizations, both large and small, have a very mixed approach to the European Union. It's not a concrete explanation. It's kind of like a, we'll critically engage, I believe is the term I've heard used, which can mean whatever the fuck you want it to mean, basically. It doesn't mean we're for staying with it or we're for leaving it. In most cases, critically critical engagement translates into remain in reform, which is unfortunately totally unacceptable. So what's happening in Ireland is, is that because the right are leading the conversation for the time being, it's not a very loud conversation and it's focused on stuff like immigration, but they are still leading it. So when an actual discussion happens, that's who people will defer to as those who have already led that conversation, just like they did in Britain. So, I mean, that that's a self-criticism, if anything, in the sense that it's our job to lead the conversation on why Ireland should not be in the European Union. I want, I want, you, I want to ask you about about um, why you believe that the left should be making that case. But first, you mentioned that there a, there was a lot of propaganda from the ruling parties and from the European Union as to the benefits of the European Union for the Irish people. Uh, do you want to give us yeah. a few examples of that? I'm I'm not like particularly familiar with it. Okay. Well, it's 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 simple stuff from putting up little billboards saying that this motorway was funded by the European Union or partly funded by the European Union and heaping praise on it to things like interrailing, which is sold as this magnificent journey for young people. But the question is, at what cost are these little things provided to Ireland? Well, the cost in the last crisis of capitalism was 42% of the banking debt that Ireland took on through its banks that the state then guaranteed with blank checks um, and, and what, you know, so on the balance of things, what is the actual cost of EU membership? One of the most um, biggest kind of and shocking things for coastline communities in Ireland has been the collapse of the fisheries, because what Ireland did was when it joined the EEC was sign away a significant portion of its fishing territories in the Atlantic Ocean and its surrounding coastline. Okay. And that's led to a very detrimental effect. But that's not the discussion that's had in the kind of ur large urban centers or metropolitan centers. And that's not the discussion the far right is really pushing either. They're very much focused on immigrants, immigrants, immigrants. Um, you you said that it was to 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 the credit, maybe not, but uh, the, the right were leading the discussion for in Ireland for... Yes critiquing the European Union. Yeah. Why do you believe it's the left that should be making that argument and not the right? Well, at its core, it's a anti-imperialist argument. And if we abandon anti-imperialism as a benchmark and pillar of our understanding of how to build socialism in Ireland, then we're not really left with anything. If our class doesn't understand that the European Union, from the commission to the judiciary to the parliament, is inherently incompatible with the development of socialism, then we can't develop socialism here. 
you can't develop socialism if you're a colony because you'll never be allowed to and you'll be penalized and punished. And in order to to do that, we have to make that clear and concise argument that we can we can build a better republic here and it has to be unfortunately outside of the European Union. What a lot of people seem to identify that with and I find that that's a success of propaganda is the idea that if you leave the European Union, you're leaving the European community, which is really not the case at all. The reason that event or that set of events could transpire is because the capitalist countries of the European Union would want to ostracize a socialist country, just like they ostracize other socialist countries and ruthlessly attack them. So I think if the left fail to make that argument, the discussion about the EU will be focused on immigration and other nonsense kind of stuff that doesn't really factor in to the very deep inequalities that we face in Ireland. I mean, the immigration argument is is, is just, I think, I would, I would say probably in the UK, more a case of uh, training your workers to fulfill the jobs that, that people get brought in as immigrants to do. Uh, treat like in for example in our health service we're crying out for nurses and, and at the same time not training enough nurses <laughs> and, and so we are forced as a country if we want to fill those positions to to you know allow people to come in and yeah work. yeah M- marx refers to this as the cost of social reproduction it's the cost it's essentially the wage that a worker needs to receive in order to live to pay for their roof to pay for their shelter and instead of companies that are both state-owned, by the way, and also semi-state-owned and private, obviously, the way they push that cost down is by essentially skipping the cost that it would take for people to live in Ireland. So why why pay a worker here a wage that would let them live when you can essentially squeeze them out or expect that they will migrate and import somebody from an Eastern European country and let them work for a much lower wage? And it's a strategy on the part of the ruling class. So I, I don't want it to be misinterpreted as a as an anti-immigrant kind of slant. They're being used. That's all it boils down to. And if this was a workers' republic, migrants would be paid wages that are decent and respectable and not treated like they are treated by the Keelings and Dennis O'Briens and the many other kind of large uh, firms that we have in Ireland. <laughs> So if you were taught, are you planning to try and run for, for office um, in, or have candidates run in any form of um, elections in order to bring about your um, hopeful revolution? Or are you looking to build it more as a, a movement before you would take it into the, the system of parliament? Or do you just like consider that to be completely like a waste of time and a, a legitimate measure of, of people's support because we don't know each other very well you probably have not seen me railing against electoral politics routinely i, I have not would you like to give me um like your elevator run i'll, I'll try to summarize it as concisely as i can um, okay. in ireland electoral politics has been the demise of essentially every left-wing organization that we have and there's a couple of reasons for it the first reason, and the most important one, I would argue, is that we, if we don't accept that socialism cannot be one true parliamentary reform, then our strategy will forever be linked to running candidates. And essentially, think of it like a board game. If the capitalists have created a board game, why the fuck are we playing by their rules? So that's the question I like to ask. The second thing is, is that electoral politics fundamentally changes the actual political organization that participates in it. So if you have a a member of parliament elected, they have a constituency office and people from the local area in that constituency come in to get their problem solved. Now, there's nothing inherently wrong about this, but if you actually break it down and think about it, it's not the job of members of parliament to organize plumbing for their constituents. That's the job of the local authority. But what's happened in Ireland is that by privatizing and running down local authority services and state departments and other services, it's actually elected representatives who are essentially overpaid or underpaid or overworked or underworked uh, social care workers, because that's that's essentially what they fall into. So how can a party that focuses on electoral politics while shouldering the burden of lots of constituency work 
ever hope to actually break out of that bubble. And that, that's what we see happening is it's, it's that competition. It's, it's a kind of rat race, so to speak, between various political organizations. Because at the end of the day, the, we, our main ruling parties are Fine Gael and Fianna Fáil. At the end of the day, those two parties are much more entrenched into the civil service, into the state and are much more capable of dealing, you know, with your plumbing issue or your roundabout or whatever. And that's how they maintain their clientele links. So for a revolution organization to take place, we have to understand that that's not the end goal of our struggle. It, it, it's not for us to do that kind of work and try to compete with the establishment parties. We have to demonstrate that our goal is much more long term and that it's, a, it's actually about overthrowing how the system works and ensuring that public services are performing their work adequately as opposed to councillors or or members of parliament running around uh, trying to do kind of these smaller tasks. So that's that's part of the reason. The other thing is, is I think the first point is if we don't if we accept that socialism is built through the ballot box, then we will never achieve socialism. And frankly, put the Western left has a very shoddy reputation for falling into electoral politics. Another two examples. Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders, all this talk of democratic socialism, vote for me, vote for this. Where are they? Where are they now? Where are the hundreds of thousands of people who registered to their organizations? Well, the simple answer is that they're nowhere to be found. And most of them didn't go on to join communist organizations or explicitly revolutionary organizations. They were totally disenfranchised by the social democratic process, the fact that it couldn't deliver their demands, and the fact that Despite their demands being popular, they were essentially, you could say cheated, but this is how the system works. This is the capitalist system in all its glory. Um, it was the same thing in Ireland. We didn't have a government maybe for three months while they were engaging in parliamentary talks. And some of the some of the other organizations were saying, oh, it's a stitch up, you know, they're cheating democracy. They're not cheating democracy. This is how bourgeois democracy and social democracy functions. So th these are the trappings of electoral politics. and. What I've witnessed is groups that do have electoral representation aren't actually building working class power in their areas. So in my constituency, we have a member of parliament for a Trotskyist organization. And he's not building political power for the working class. He's building political power for himself and for his organization. And these are two different things. Lenin essentially says that, look, the Bolshevik party had to have its ear to the ground, to the pulse of the working class. So it has to be marching, lock in step with it. Are left organizations doing that? I would argue that they aren't. So to answer your question in terms of participation, participation in electoral politics has to be tertiary. It has to be down the list of priorities in terms of popularizing the demands of a communist party. So if we were to hypothetically run candidates, it wouldn't be about building coal files for individuals. It wouldn't be about promising the moon and the stars for getting a few councillors or getting a few TDs elected to the parliament. It would be about popularizing existing mass struggles that we are engaged in. So to give a practical example, we're trying to build a tenants union out in, in my area. And if a candidate were to run a couple of years down the line with the sole objective of popularizing and further strengthening that tenant union, I would be of the view is that that would be a very positive way of using electoral politics to strengthen an already existing struggle. But unfortunately, what happens is it's done in reverse. And what we see is that it doesn't actually advance class struggle. We've had since 2011, and particularly 2016, we've had much more left-wing TDs than in the history of the state ever. And where's the revolution? Where are fundamental changes? The working class has gotten poor, has gotten more exploited, and it isn't being organized in a manner that actually challenges capital. One thing I will say about Bernie Sanders is that he has been incredibly successful in like, getting monstrously big changes to the Democratic platform in his two attempts to run for president. Um, as much as I am very sad that he was not successful either time. <laughs> Um, he uh, the the changes that he got had made to both Hillary Clinton's and to Joe Biden's platform. Now it remains to be seen whether those get carried out, but at least he I, I will I do like to know because I, I hear people ragging on him a lot and he 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 gave it his absolute best. He called out corruption. He did everything he could and and he came up short. 
and still was able to come away with some some pretty huge concessions on on climate change and things like that for the Democratic Party platform, as much as they're all a bunch of corrupt corporate money taking um, cunts. <laughs> um, maybe not quite that bad, but they're awful, awful, awful people. But one thing I, I wanted to qu- quiz you on was that. So you talk about how electoral politics is not um, a vehicle through which you can achieve socialism or, or reform to this like mass reform to the system to uh, revolution. Is there a, a way in which you could say? Is there, is there a reform that you could make? And, and specifically, the thing that always comes to, to my mind is um, compulsory voting and automatic voter registration. Because I believe that participation is is so is, could be such a huge like way of galvanizing support for, for ideas and from people who have just been completely forgotten by politics. And I feel that perhaps if it were much easier or even compulsory to vote but then i don't like to tell people what to do um that you could you could see mass change being affected like because because of the popularity of the issues on the and the policies that, that you're potentially suggesting do, do you see that as, as a legitimate like way to enact change or is that not, would we not even get to that point with without some form of like revolution well, if we examine the countries that have compulsory voting, Australia springs to mind. Have revolutionary changes occurred in Australia? They haven't. And the reason for that isn't because certain mechanisms don't exist. It's because the working class has essentially continuously been misled by the same two and a half, three party system as in Britain or Ireland. So if compulsory voting was brought in in Ireland, would it fundamentally change the landscape of the political kind of dynamics in Ireland, it might change it by a couple of percent. But at the end of the day, we saw parties that kind of consider themselves total opponents, Fianna Gael and Fianna Fáil primarily, who were on the opposite sides of the civil war 100 years ago, uh, come together within the space of two months and make a deal in order to go into government together and are now talking about merging. So capital always finds arrangements, no matter how. What I would see as revolutionary kind of changes done through parliamentary influence would be referendums as being a quite a straightforward one. But even then, in the parliamentary process here and probably in Westminster, a bill that goes to vote first has to go through committee stages. Oh, sorry. When it passes by voting, it goes to committee stages. You and get what two happens, readings, then you get committee and then you get your third reading. Yeah. Um, so he, here, what happened was in 2016, there was one of the largest mobilizations of our class that we've ever had to protest against the privatization of water. And a bill was passed through the Dáil, through our parliament, calling for a referendum on the public ownership of water. That was 2016. The bill has since then lagged behind in the committees because they know how to stagnate, to, ki- to kill it, essentially, even though Hypothetically, it passed the legislature, so it should come into effect. So even the limitations of referendum are exposed there. I I think parliamentary struggle should basically form like part of the strategy, but not be the exclusive strategy, which is unfortunately the case on the left in Ireland, that if you went through parliament, you know, we can give you socialism. And that's not really the case. You can't, for example, um, what would be a good example? You couldn't rewrite the entire constitution, even if you had a majority of members of parliament. And that 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 is exactly what you would need to do if you were starting to rebuild a socialist republic. That's you you'd reconstruct it from the ground up. The law of the land would have to change from start to finish. And that's just not possible because of the committee parliamentary style approach to legislation that we have. So how how would you go about governing? Or bringing about your your mass movement, if you you chose not to focus, you said that okay, the electoral politics would be potentially an aspect of it, but not the main focus. Like, where would the main focus be? Well, as Connolly said, unless the working class is industrially organised and economically organised, it can't be politically organised. So the job of the Connolly Youth and the Communist Party has been to engage in trade union organising and tenant union organising. I would say that these are the two 
foundational pillars of any mass revolutionary movement in the country. And until these two pillars are actually built up to a sufficient point that they can deal some serious damage to the capitalist class, nothing will change. And let me say as well that we could have zero elected representatives on local authorities or national authorities, but have very muscular trade unions and be able to significantly impact society more than we would if we had 10 elected members of parliament and several councillors, because that's simply the dynamics between capital and labour. At the end of the day, that's what it takes to win. And we see that vindicated, I, I would argue, historically, where there's high union density, there's a link to militant workers, where there's low union density, there's a link to precarious wages, poverty, um, the conditions in the factory kind of we're looking at meat plants in Ireland, for instance, that used to be unionized and are now are stacked with Eastern European workers who are doing backbreaking labor and treated like it's fucking 1840s Dickensian kind of factories. That, that, that's what it's being driven to. And our job is to organize these people and to link them into our common struggle against one enemy, the capitalist class. So what do you make what would you make of the criticism of of the modern left that it's gone from being leninist to leninist um that, that it's all a bunch of middle class hippies I wouldn't <laughs> say Marxists. I wouldn't say it's all a bunch of middle class hippies but there are certain events in history and I think the attempt by the Soviet Union to engage in peaceful reconciliation with the west probably took away a lot of the militant edge that some of the communist parties might have engaged with in the name of diplomacy. Now, look, it's not for me to sit here and say that was the right decision or that was the wrong decision. The dynamics back then were basically uh, some sort of peace or nuclear war and another war in Europe. So whatever way that played out, it played out. What I do find is, is though, that a lot of the parties became Euro-communist, they became social democratic, and then they started splintering. The, the secret speech by Khrushchev was a huge moment in communist his, party history around the world. Parties split everywhere over whether Stalin was a communist, essentially, or whether he was a mass murdering, brutal tyrant. And then the events in Czechoslovakia and Hungary played a huge role. And finally, the actual the success of capitalist restoration in Eastern Europe was like a nail in the coffin of a lot of communist parties. There was no new people joining communist parties for 25 years up until basically the capitalist crisis of 2008 because it was seen as you know communism lost so we shouldn't kind of bother with it and that's the end of the case so i think parties fell into these revisionist and anti-communist tendencies out of confusion and also out of the that kind of peaceful reconciliation that occurred in the in the name of better relations between uh, Soviet communism and Western capitalism to try to find an accord. And if we take all that apart and kind of look at the modern last 10 years, I would say from my trips internationally, either to Athens or to Austria and meeting with fraternal communist organizations, there's definitely a revival of a very orthodox Leninist movement in Europe and around the world. The other thing worth pointing out is that it's a very Eurocentric question. So yes, in Europe, a lot of parties fell apart or splintered or became revisionist. But revolutions in Southeast Asia or Africa or Latin America continued. So it's not like China or Korea or Laos or Vietnam fell apart. Their communist parties have hundreds of millions of members. The same with India. India has maybe 20 million members in its communist party. So perhaps of consistently looking at Europe and looking at such an inward way. We should also look at the successes of our fraternal comrades outside of Europe, outside of the kind of white Western world. In Royava, for example, a revolution essentially built on Marxist-Leninist lines was carried out in a certain section of the country. We have to examine those successes and also the failures. But I, I, I think I would agree that the left has essentially become what is constituted as left is now social democracy. And that's a problem, but it's down to us to actually rectify the perception that working class people have of what socialism and the left means. 
Do you think the focus um, by the left on social justice has been detrimental to your to the the cause of economic justice? Well, at at, at the root of all problems, or most of them, lies the relationship of labour and capital and who owns the means of production. So if you strip away that actual aspect of any struggle, then what you're left with is liberalism. And if you struggle only for social justice, exclusive of economic justice, if you don't organise workers along their class lines, well, yes, it is detrimental, de detrimental to the left. And what you have is a is a kind of a wave of liberalism capturing social media and also left organizations who, instead of organizing fucking factories and workers and tenants, are focused on very almost college kind of issues um, that don't manifest themselves in the same way they do for the rest of the working class. And unfortunately, it's not really yielded the results that maybe maybe are sought after, you know, as they say, the the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So I, I understand that people might think they're doing something productive and struggling for, for a certain cause. But if that cause isn't linked on a very practical and mechanical level to to your class and goes back to your, your relationship to the means of production, then what are you actually achieving besides a short term or minute change? So what are you working on at the moment is there uh, any particular projects um, campaigns whatnot that you're, you're you're running at the moment that you want to talk about so lockdown has been a massive pain in the ass bluntly put but we successfully shifted most of our work basically to just education so we did we did we had maybe two education sessions a week using zoom for our benefit and I'd say we covered a bit of everything, to be perfectly honest with you. There's no real there's no real set of ideas that we emphasized more on, but we did quite a lot on organizing as well, with a view to now that restrictions are easing, we want our members in all our branches to be involved either with our trade union or their tenant union or both. So in the areas that we have branches in, which is Dublin, Belfast, Derry, Waterford, Limerick, Galway, Cork. Our members are, for example, attending the picket lines for the Debenhams workers and expressing their solidarity and chatting to them. Where we have members who are privately renting, they are joining the Community Action Tenant Union, CASU, which is a model based off the ACORN model in Britain. So in areas that they can help, stuff like door knocking and getting people signed up to CASU is something our members are doing. We're preparing an industrial um, trade union campaign for hopefully September. And if possible, earlier, with a view to taking on a large multinational and attempting to organize their workers into a trade union. And at the end of the day, these are the bread and butter issues that unify workers of all genders, of all religions, of all ethnicities and of all backgrounds, because those are the issues that actually change their relationship in their in their immediate surrounding, which is their workplace and give them a bit of agency over their own lives. If you flip that. It's trade unions and organized workers who are the biggest and strongest proponents of social justice issues. So, for example, trade unionists uh, for abortion rights in Ireland was one of the central pillars that was able to finally push through and assist the pushing through of a referendum. And that's very important to note. If we go back a little bit historically, we'll see that it was organized workers who started a very prolonged campaign to not have to handle South African goods because of the apartheid in South Africa. Again, that was trade union members. So at the root of all struggles, at the root of all very good struggles, are organized workers. And that's where the CYM finds itself. Um, in recent times as well, members have been confronting fascist groups and far-right groups around the country. So you might have seen an article done by the Beacon.ie a couple of days ago where CYM members successfully kind of blockaded a far-right stall in Cork City Centre that was advocating anti-immigration stuff, anti-abortion stuff, um, and a lot of other nonsense. So that that's kind of it in a nutshell, to be honest. Um, alongside all of that, we're trying to do kind of cultural activities. So we place a big emphasis on our mental health and our emotional health. So stuff like hiking, training together. A few of us are into MMA or Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu or Thai boxing. 
Um, and we, we want to cultivate a kind of healthy environment where people embrace sports and embrace kind of camaraderie activities. We would usually have a summer school at the end of August, but unfortunately, because of COVID, the hostel that we usually book into is closed. So there won't be a summer school as far as I know yet. Um, and it's not looking likely. But like even at our summer school, the sort of stuff we do is we go on a big hike through the mountains. We do a bit of yoga. We all go swimming together. We take turns cooking for each other. So it's not just about the politics of doing stuff and knocking on doors and constantly chatting about class struggle. It's also about building a counterculture to what is a very toxic culture among young people at the moment, focused in on substance abuse. And change starts at home. So the CYM has to has to be the proponent of a healthy kind of look after yourself. It's probably not good for you to drink five times a week or be hooked on some sort of substance that, you know, completely robs you of your life. Um, and th like th those are the kind of things we're up to, I suppose. That's, that's, that's a summary of stuff. No, that sounds fantastic. I, I love the, the emphasis on community um, and because, you know, in the incre ever increasingly connected world we are, as cliche as it is now to say it becoming like less connected to to your fellow man um, ironically enough, huh? yeah <laughs> but something that i've also been enjoying over lockdown was um trying to now be able to appreciate the time i spend with my friends like if i'm i'm with them i um it, it feels like there's a lot of things that, that you, you take for granted until it's taken away. And, and I feel like those that, that's one of those things that, that lockdown has really taught me is the, the how much I value like the social interaction, not just on the phone or, or on Skype, because that can get tiring after a while. Yeah. It's, it's just not the same talking to your screen. Not that this is bad. <laughs> like, this yeah. is fine. I'm used I, to I get what you mean totally. <laughs> You just Absolutely. don't you don't get the same like connection that you would with, with especially with your friends and people that yeah. you, you want that like to form or have that strong emotional bond with. So I love For that sure. you guys are doing that. But um I have to bounce here. Um so is there anything you would like to plug, push, um send me links to and whatnot to say your piece now? Yeah. Ah, just for anybody listening, have a look at our website and if in doubt, reach out to one of the branches. We operate a very open door policy in terms of what level of political development young people come in at because we, we, we don't consider ourselves preachers or kind of bringing the holy gospel of Marxism to you. It's for you to research and to identify with and to actually experience because class struggle, whether anybody likes it or not, is part of their day to day experience. And the slogan of the CYM is agitate, educate, organize, which essentially summarizes all of our activities and our relationship to our peers and other young people. We want to agitate young people so they understand why they're actually angry and get angry about the fact that they paid fucking minimum wage and a shitty job and treated like horseshit. We want to educate them so they actually understand the reason that, that happens is because A, they're not organized and B, unorganized workers can be taken advantage of as individuals. And this will happen until they actually do something about and finally organize, you know, give them the tools for their own emancipation. If the working class was organized, young people were organized, we could kick the shit out of pretty much anyone. And that's that's the end goal. That's what we should all be striving for. So thank you for your time on this podcast. And I look forward to listening back to it. Yeah, it was fantastic. Thanks very much, man. Thanks for your time, man. Thanks so much for listening. If you haven't already and you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to this podcast and to our mailing list. And don't forget my book, Brexit, The Establishment Civil War, is now available for pre-order on Amazon. You'll find the link in the description below. Until next time, thanks for listening.